Oh, Papa says, any time not spent on love is wasted. And over the next 45 minutes, we plan to join by all kinds of wonderful, smart people who waste no time. Ah, all right, well, I'm just delighted you guys showed up. Thank you so much. Uh, well, there's only three of you, so we can uh, we can do this. Uh, we can welcome, let me welcome, first of all, uh, Andrew Kantrowitz. We love our dear friend, Dr. Andrew Kantrowitz, who's calling us from, where are you? New York. New York. New York. That's right. And uh, you, and tell us what you teach over there in New York. Well, I actually I teach in Philadelphia. I teach at Tyler School of Art and um, art education, basically. Yeah, and I also teach drawing at Pratt Institute in Brooklyn. Uh, okay. And we're also joined by my good buddy, Dr. Uh, not Dr. Uh, uh, Daniel Witcher Esquire. <laughs> Dan yes. is a bankruptcy lawyer. And Dan knows what happens when romance meets Chapter 11. Yes. Thank you, Aaron. Always Lovely. good to see you. Yeah. <laughs> and, of course, my, uh, my, my homie, my uh, homie, uh, my good buddy, Steve, uh, Dr. Stephen Reese, who is the executive director of the Gable Institute for Integrative Health. Great to be with you. That's true. We've got to, now we have to make it not do that. All right. So let's see if we can turn off Google. Let's see somebody else trying to get on. Okay, we'll get rid of that more in a second. And we'll move on. All right. So, guys, Herman, I'd love to start off with you. If you could just tell us a little bit about uh, the forces of attraction as they relate, forces of attraction in physics. Hi, I'm Herman White, and uh, thanks very much for inviting me, Aaron. This is great. I'm a particle physicist at the Fermi National Accelerator Laboratory, and Aaron asked me to talk about the attractions that is natural to the laws of physical science. And one of those, of course, is the large-scale attraction that you have that's a function of just the mass. So if you have the sun and you have the earth and you have the moon, the reason that they actually stay in a nice, stable system relatively stable, is because there's a force in nature that is proportional just to the mass of those objects, the distances they are from each other, that is inversely proportional to that distance. And that force is a force of attraction. This is what we call gravity. And gravity keeps us on the Earth, it keeps the planets connected, and it turns out if you move these masses far apart, those masses will still be proportional, but the force will start getting smaller and smaller and smaller, but it will never go to zero. So even in the large scale, when you think about large massive objects that are in our universe, they are in fact attracted as a result of the gravitational force. And but I feel in those things that are really, really small, these are called partons or quarks, and they're inside of the nucleus of the, of the atom, and they are held together very, very strongly by something we call the strong force. And that's also dependent upon how close you are. But when you start pulling these atoms apart, which we do all the time with our large accelerator, you get a lot of energy that's released and tells you basically that there's a lot of energy that is used to keep them close together. Hey, now, Stephen, you maybe have the most kind of stereotypic view of Valentine's Day because you know about the heart. It's a holiday so, of the heart. Yeah, well, tell us a little about how the heart responds to attraction. Attraction. Well, in in many ways, uh, when the heart, uh, when people view an object of uh, desire, or and even more so, a person of desire, there's a real, real physiologic uh, reaction, which is uh, brought out in many ways. Uh, one of which is hormones are released that uh, are like uh, adrenaline that stimulate the body and stimulate the heart. And specifically what these hormones do for the heart is to make the heart beat faster and stronger. And I think it's kind of an idea that love is uh, a force that, that uh, I think signals opportunity that's important, perhaps a little bit of danger. And the body responds to opportunity and danger by getting itself in a full alert state. So that's a quick heartbeat and a forceful one. So Herman, so do, do particles 
respond to the do they respond to any into the nearness of another particle or are they just swept in by the forces that affect particles? Well, particles have particular characteristics. I mean, if you look at many of the particles that exist, they have this quantity which we call charge. And depending upon the polarity of that charge, a positive charge and a negative charge will attract each other. And a positive charge and a positive charge will repel each other. But that attraction is due to a magnetic attraction, and you want to call it magnetic. I, we use the words uh, somewhat universally, but in physics, there isn't such a thing as magnetic attraction, though I think we say it in sociology as well. But yes, the particles have characteristics that allow them essentially to be connected with each other as close as they possibly can with, without essentially destroying the integrity of the particle itself. And that particular attraction, which we call magnetic or electromagnetic attraction for the smallest particles that actually can have a charge associated with it, or for the most fundamental particles, they can actually be connected by something we call gluons. And they are confined inside of uh, the more complex one. But Steve, when the heart pumps, aren't, isn't that a function of attraction? Aren't the muscles, aren't the, the actin and the mycin and the mycin being pulled closer together? Little, little rails sliding closer together? That's Absolutely. Oh, that's true. And, and so, it's fascinating that the heart, even on the microscopic level, as you point out, is really a, a study of attraction and of of interaction and of uh, uh, kind of joining together. Absolutely, there are, are uh, thin and thick filaments in the muscle fibers of the heart, and these need to slide past each other in order for the heart to beat. And so there's really an attraction and an interaction that's really at the basis of every one of our heartbeats. And, and actually, I mean, in real life, that's a, a, that attraction is physics, isn't it, Herman? You know, yeah. because essentially it, it's a change in the charge of the cell. Yeah. It's, it, it is a characteristic that if you don't have any charge, like a neutron, for example, or even a neutrino particle, and these are sort of fanciful names for these particles, but if they don't have this, this charge, so to speak, they don't do anything. They sit, and they're still, they're still connected by gravity because they have mass. And anything that has mass will, in fact, have an attractive force, even if it happens to be very, very small. But it will be overwhelmed by electromagnetic force or overwhelmed by being confined inside of larger, more complex particles. It can get very complicated, just like love. <laughs> so, Andrea, then I, as an artist, you one of one of your jobs is to kind of translate human emotions and emotions that you feel into two dimensional works that you get paid gigantic amounts of money for. But so, but you also know a little bit about the the neuroscience attendant to passion and attraction, uh -huh. right? Well, what, what I'm thinking about in in hearing um, Herman and Stephen talk, I'm thinking about drawing, and what drawing is about is defining spaces between. But in between spaces, so you make marks that sort of demarcate the in between spaces, and being sensitive to those in between spaces is, is what really defines great drawing. Now you know that's really interesting because that gets into one of the really interesting aspects of being sensitive to the in between spaces, because in romance, right. one of the great tools of romance, and actually, uh, Andrea, one of the great tools of art. Is deception. You, as an artist, you want me to look at this two-dimensional object. All right. I'm looking at three dimensions. Am I right? Mm -hmm. Is that right? Mm -hmm. I mean, so you a willing to... suspension of disbelief. Oh, okay. It's suspension of disbelief. Right. Suspension of disbelief. But my point is, because you talk about the spaces. Because Irving gets your mind is that one of the most interesting aspects of the way the physical world deceives us mm -hmm. is solidity. Right. Now, how does how do what is it, what, what am I talking about? Herman, <laughs> <laughs> what am I talking about that the world we're deceived to thinking the world is solid? Well, um, if you if you look at the complete composition of everything that is what we call matter 
as you get to much smaller compositions of this, if I take a ball and I break it up, it, I, I see that there's a lot more into it than just the ball. If I break up the parts that made up those parts, I see there's more into it than that. And it turns out that when I actually look at the just the stuff that I can't in fact break up anymore, that there's a lot of space, just as she said, there's a lot of space between absolutely everything. Our bodies, for example, are about 70% water. And of course, the doctor is going to tell me whether that's true or not. But when you think about the mass of, of how much you weigh or 200 pounds and that sort of thing, you think about that 70% is just water. We are water bags. But in the physical world, aha, I, I, I see a, a hand up. Yeah. <laughs> in the physical world, when we think about, uh, when we think about actually the, the, the moving around of the components, if I heat up some water, for example, it will get to a different type of configuration. So I can have ice, I can have water, I can have steam, all oh. making up of exactly the same thing, and yeah, you just yeah. change the space between the, the molecules and the material that makes up the, 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 the material. But Katrina, were you saying something? Yes, I wonder I had kind of uh, Trina is calling from a, our Trina international Trina, I just want to say that Trina is calling us from Norway. Mm -hmm. right, joining us from Norway. One of, yep. my, one of my favorite Coursera students who always gets higher grades than me on all the courses. <laughs> well, I found this whole issue about mass very interesting and density because uh, in physics, as far as I know, the bigger mass has a higher attraction value. If you're a, a bigger object, right. attracts the smaller. Mass. Yeah, and if you think about people, so, for one thing, uh, women tend to be more attractive to a uh, male with denser body composure, more muscles than fat, if you talk about density. And the other thing, um, I discussed it with my son yesterday, if you look at European politicians, they have a certain pondus, if you like. They're not very thin and lean. They have a certain weight. And I've heard some people who have lost quite a bit of weight, and they find it difficult to be leaders for a while because they felt they lacked a bit of heaviness to be attractive. And then also we have the psychological, in the modern time, is mass heaviness more a psychological thing, like if you're rich or whatever. So it's kind of interesting. No, no, no that's all attraction and body. Mass. Well, you know, that's really interesting because there's a, a back when they were uh, trying, before they had discovered the Higgs boson, uh, you may remember there was a, a contest to see who could explain what the heck the Higgs boson was. And somebody talked about, uh, the, the winning example was that imagine that Margaret, the fact that there's a meeting of the Conservative Party and some minor MP walks through the room and weakly interacts with the people in the room. Hmm. But then Margaret Thatcher walks in the room, and she's like the Higgs boson. <laughs> you know? And so she interacts strongly with all the different politicians. So as she uh, goes through the room, or as it goes through the Higgs, bo Higgs field, she would become more massive. Yeah. <laughs> so the more, the more massive thing can attract more. And kind of look at Angela Merkel these days. She has a heaviness who? Who? in oh, her, not only in kilos, but and she's a very attractive. Uh, people are attracted to her power and her. Well, but you know, this goes back to what I wanted to get my buddy Dan to talk a little bit about, which is deception, because yep. we do go to great lengths to make ourselves look either larger or smaller or richer than we really are, and that's a part of the mating ritual, you know, to kind of puff yourself up. You know, let's say you know, we like to pretend that we don't have bodily functions on the first couple of dates. With young, Dan, with young Dan, when those illusions hit chapter 11, what happens? So what happens a lot of times is, first of all, Aaron, um, always great to be with you, always fantastic angles that you have on everything. It's um, always interesting when you and I are not naked together. <laughs> we a lot of time naked together. Usually we're at least partially clothed. <laughs> um, but, but really... 
the part of the deception, or at least the courtship, starts when people are first dating. And one of the taboo subjects at the beginning when you're courting somebody is, is money. I don't think that a woman would ask a man on, on his first date what his salary is. However, you know, she'll ask different questions about what he does and everything. So then it leads through the courtship to the marriage, and hopefully people that, that are thinking through this thing would have a few money discussions, would have discussions about um, what they feel about spending or saving and general topics like that. But what I find a lot of times is, is either before or most of the time after they get married, they come to my office and things are not as rosy as they thought. So I'll give you a quick example. When, when I was engaged to my wife shortly thereafter, my wife said to me, she goes, you know, everything's fine except for that $10,000 credit card I've got. Mm -hmm. And she knows I'm a bankruptcy lawyer and my mouth just about, my jaw just about hit the ground. I'm like, what are you talking about? And of course, it was, it was her deception. It was her joke. But we had discussions, so we knew what, what our money values were. But then when I see clients come in my office, I might have somebody go through their charge cards, getting back to the neurons and protons. We have positive and negative charges also on credit cards. <laughs> it's you. So, so then I have, I have a gentleman talking in my office about these charges at J.B. Robinson Jewelers. And the wife looks at me. She says, I didn't get any, any jewelry from you. So... <laughs> Yeah. There's a deception there as well. So, Steve, I assume that even for doctors, hearts can be deceptive, that, you, that symptoms, that hearts can do things that can have multiple interpretations. I mean, oh. legitimately. Absolutely. Actually, it's one of the biggest problems in medicine. Uh, very few, for instance, of people who come into the emergency room who have uh, chest discomfort where, of course, the number one uh, concern is that it's a heart problem. It turns out that very, very few of people who come into the emergency room that way end up truly having a heart problem. Usually it's something entirely different. But because the stakes are so high, it's really important to sort out uh, and to see which are the deceptive ones that, that look like a heart problem but aren't and and then the ones that truly are and sifting through you know finding finding the uh, the one out of 10 or one out of 20 that actually is that's quite a bit of detective work and the heart is a great masquerader uh, even symptoms coming from the heart can be experienced in a very different location in the mouth as a toothache or in the back as backache and so the heart has got a lot of connections. It's got a lot of nervous connections and hydraulic connections and problems that originate in one place in the heart can show up in a very remote location. So it actually is quite a bit of detective work. And it, it's the excitement of medicine to sort that out, to take the history and examination and some lab tests and yeah. to try and figure it out. Herman, are there heart, there must be heart pounding moments in physics. Oh, yes. You must. <laughs> yes. When was the last time your heart pounded? The discovery of the Higgs boson was a, <laughs> that was a big pounder because people had been looking for that for 27 years or so and it was predicted back in the 1960s when I was in high school as a matter of fact. And so to, to think about the fact that you have a view of how the universe works and a view of of what should in fact be our true understanding of what is going to actually be a description of the universe and then be able to find all the little small components one by one over about five decades and they absolutely are correct but you have to find them physics is you know you have theoretical ideas but you have to make that measurement and, uh, and a couple of years ago a few years ago we actually found this uh, Higgs boson, the one that Aaron was just talking about, and that was a true heart-pounding uh, event. Everybody in, in our country, they made the announcement at uh, 9 o'clock in the morning in Europe, and there were people in my laboratory at 2 o'clock in the morning watching and alive because this was just such a great event. I mean, that you could really feel the hearts pounding in that room because they didn't quite know, number one, 
Did they find it? Number two, what was the mass of this pop uh, object? And of course, even Mr. Higgs and all the people who actually had predicted this uh, this event uh, were in the audience. It was an inc an incredible event. I was very very excited about. So, would it be fair Herman, to say? And I want to ask everybody this and try to understand what it means. Herman, is it fair to say you love physics? You know. <laughs> Uh, I sort of reserve love for my wife <laughs> and my mother and my and my my nieces and nephews and and uh, you know people in my family. I I, I do understand uh, you know the sort of broad use of the term love. Um, it does if you look at it from the point of view of it generating a certain response for me, uh, which is different than you know eating a hamburger. Yes, in that regard. Uh, at the same time, it's not the same level of emotional attachment or do anything that you can for your, your loved ones uh, as opposed to saying this is something I really, really enjoy, it's something I really like, and very privileged to be able to actually find out something that no one has ever known before. Now, that's one could say you love that, but more than likely you could say it's just a... a it's, it's an event. It is. You, you're right about the heart pounding. That's really a heart pounding when you actually see something revealed to you that you just want to tell everybody about. Right. When you're in love, you want everybody. Well, Andrea, let me, and, I want to ask Andrea. Andrea, what about you? Do you love your work? And what does that mean if you do? I think for me, being an artist is a way of kind of um, it not. It's not that I love the work, but it's a way to be closer to. The world and the things in the world, so it's it's a way about it's a way of expressing love for just being alive. So it's not the art that I love, but the art that is a vehicle for loving life. You know. Art is a way of expressing love for being alive. Or it's not it's not expressing it's a vehicle. So the act of of it makes me closer. It makes me notice things about people I love, for example, or just the world around me that bring it brings me closer to those things that or experiences, a quality of experience which is enriched. Has your work made your heart pound lately? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I think I kind of agree with Herman about that whole the relationship between work that you're really passionate about and the people that you love. It's not the same thing. So, but it makes me. I think it makes me notice thing, things about the people that I love. It makes me. I think it makes me more alive. So it makes me capable of loving the people in my life more. I think your that, work. Yeah. The fulfillment that you get from your work. The, not just the fulfillment. It's the it's the act of sort of observation and really trying to understand what I'm looking at. And appreciating beauty, which makes me appreciate be the beauty in everything else, just a little bit more. Doctor, Doctor, Doctor DeVries. <laughs> you must, you must have I like the way you've got a voice. I, 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 I want to make sure to give you your props, brother. But surely <laughs> you have heart pounding is something you know a lot about, and. But in your own work, do you love your work, and does it make your heart pound? It does. It does. And you know what I what I think, although you know exactly as uh, Herman and the others had said, I I think the expression of love um, for my work is very different from my personal life. But I think there's a lot of there's a lot of commonalities, and the one that I think you know to your question is that the love of uh, the work in terms of you know, trying to understand how to keep the heart healthy and and how to keep people feeling well and in the full sense alive, it 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 really is in in very much it's an exploration of trying to understand the mysteries of life. So in this case, it's the mysteries of the heart. In the case of loving someone, it's understanding them and and peeling and understanding the many layers that that are you know not apparent at first glance. And so I think there are some commonalities, and to me, love is is wanting to devote yourself in a very 
focused way, in a way that um, uh, is is very um, intensive and 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 feeling from within uh, that that you want to do that very strongly. And to that sense, I, I do you know I do love my work. I, I do think that. Uh, I find it fascinating the mysteries that we've been able to uncover about uh, all of the beauty of the heart, the functions, and the ones that we still don't know about. And many of them relate to uh, things that we've been talking about, how the mind affects the heart. Uh, we know that um, there is something called a broken heart syndrome, for instance, where people who feel like their heart's been broken through love gone wrong or through personal things in other arenas gone wrong, they can actually develop a very serious type of life-threatening heart failure. And we can describe a few things about them that the catecholamine levels go up. Wait a second, we wait don't a get it. We don't wait, get it. You, are you genuinely saying that your emotional life can cause your, cause your actual physical heart damage and injury? To almost literally break. When they say broken heart, almost literally. The heart, it doesn't actually break, break, but it breaks in terms of not working uh, anywhere near it should. There's a, a condition, this broken heart syndrome, it's got a fancy name, which is Takatsubo's cardiomyopathy, which is really interesting. Takatsubo <laughs> means, uh, it means a, uh, 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 it's a, uh, a fishing, uh, fishing jar used in Japan. It's kind of an odd-shaped jar, and it's the shape that the heart assumes when it's not working properly after this broken heart syndrome takes hold. And it's a very, very uh, severe weakening of the heart that happens very quickly. And it simulates, it looks like a heart attack, like a blockage of one of the arteries that causes a heart attack, but in many people the arteries are wide open. And the only thing that these people have when you when you look at them carefully is a history of a, an event in the the few days or week prior of some very severe stress like the death of a loved one or a loss of a job something like that it's really fascinating so when you talk getting back to the mysteries you know how does that happen we know there's a very strong connection between the mind and the heart but what is the mechanism of that? Why does it happen to some people and not to others? It's interesting that m many people, if they can be supported during this, survive. But some people, unfortunately, do do die as a result. But you know, what is it that makes people come back after they've they've gone through this? How do they recover? So it's just an example of one of the mysteries that I think is fascinating. It's it's incredible, and it and I think it's quite beautiful too to say that wow, there's a whole arena of inputs that go into the heart that we only know a little bit about. Oh, I so find it fascinating. I'm in love with thinking about that idea. <laughs> I want to take a moment here to apologize to our other guests who, for whatever technical reasons, the beloved Peggy Mason, the fabulous Robbie Emmaus, uh, Jane Lovell, people who I invited, my, my buddy Gordon, but there were a bunch of folks who were invited. And for whatever technical reasons, it just didn't, uh, has not yet happened. So I, I apologize deeply, and I appreciate you trying to do it. I, you guys made it, and I really appreciate that very much uh, immensely, too. Right so there. here's the, the thing, the big thing, and let me see if I could do it. The big thing that I learned this week about love. Uh, so I was at a, an event um, with Bill Higgins. You know Bill Higgins, right, Herman? Herman. Yes, I know Bill. Yeah. Um, so he, he talked about Pluto, right? And uh, the orbits of Pluto, and how the. Wait a second, let me just. I want to try to get this. Make it. I can make it work. Let's show it. Okay, it is. So Pluto and its moon Charon, uh. and Charon. It turns out that Charon is about half the mass of Pluto. And the, uh, as opposed to the our moon of Earth, which is about 1.2 percent the mass of the Earth, and so because uh, because our, our moon is so much smaller, it basically seems to circle the Earth. But because Charon's moon, the Charon is half the mass of Pluto, Charon does not circle Pluto, does not orbit Pluto. But both Pluto, can you see this? Mm -hmm. 
both Pluto and Charon orbit their Berry centers, the uh, the center of the attractive force between them. Mm -hmm. right. right. And that strikes me as how love works. You know, yes. Can you see this? Mm -hmm. Yes, and then that kind of very centric arc. But let me say, but it also strikes me is that sort of how it works with the careers and the work <laughs> that we love. That you could, that all of us, all of us like, do things that that we don't. We try not to let our lives revolve around our work, nor does our certainly our work that revolve around us. But there is something that attracts us to this work, that around which we revolve. We contribute to the work, and the work gives back to us. Does that make any sense? No, <laughs> it makes no sense at all. <laughs> Well, I mean, it's certainly, it's certainly this way in marriages, right? You certainly get how it is in marriages. In marriages, you both revolve, your actions revolve around the relationship. Mm -hmm. Fair? You often say that in my line of view, uh, because we, I'm a teacher, so you say as long as you have students, you learn. Ah! So it's okay. the interaction. I don't know whether you have a similar saying in English. Yes. Yes. It sounds just like that. Right, and then it's very true because uh, I would use the word love for my students because I follow them from three years, five days a week. So I would be a very cold person if I didn't fall in love with each and every one of them. Well, but what about with the kind of really interesting? With you as a teacher too, would you think that is? Do you think that as well, Andrea? Absolutely, I think that's that's the secret of teaching. Is but, that, but that's all personal, right. that you mm -hmm. love people. Yeah. You love, no, but I think, you know, it's, I don't necessarily love them the way I love my own children, but certainly when I'm in the classroom, and now I'm teaching college students, that I, if I don't find in my heart a feeling of love for them, I, I'm, I know I'm not as, I'm not really teaching them in the same way. And I think what making that connection, having that emotional connection, Feeds me too. It go. It's it's very much like that that um, Pluto and Charon that you just showed us. <laughs> but I'm not exactly sure which one is the teacher and which one is the student in that. In that. I don't think it alternates. And also, you and I, we love the subjects we teach as well. So well, that's, a lot of attractions and loves in on many levels once right. you go in there. But see, that is exactly, exactly what I meant about this relationship with very centrism. That yep. what you and I are connected by the what uh, the force that attracts us, which is really curiosity, mm -hmm. which is what attracts me to a lot of you guys. You know, that, that we're all curious people, we're interested, and it's not about me, it's not about Dan, it's not about Herman, but it's about the things that we're interested in, and that's what attracts us and keeps us, what connects us and pulls us together. Mm -hmm. that, that's fair, isn't it? Right. Yeah. I think it's fair, but I, I think you should also remember that, uh, you know, it's just one universe. I mean, everything is connected one way or another. I mean, maybe a, a, a slight connection, but everything is, is connected. If I, if I take uh, Pluto is somehow, well, now connected to our solar system. Our solar system is connected to our galaxy. The galaxy is connected to some other galaxy. And that connection, though it may be very far apart and somewhat weak, as you get closer and closer together, that particular connection gets stronger and stronger. So I could be connected to you by friendship or connected to these new people that I've uh, just now met by our own intellectual curiosity and by the fact that we have a certain respect for the, for the uh, um, I guess, the professionalism that they have attained. And I am just sitting here listening. I'm going to have to look up this taco thing that uh, <laughs> I just heard because that just sounded so cool, you know, to, to say, I understand your heart and uh, it's uh, it's it's. You just have to protect it from this taco business. Maybe <laughs> <laughs> a question a about the heart, since mm -hmm. I have all these great experts. Uh, we talk about connections, and usually uh, lungs and heart are almost always presented together. Whether you're in love, you get the heart pounding and dryness of mouth and shortness of breath, or whether you exercise or whatever. Usually they are mixed together. But uh, we have had a discussion at the local gym lately because usually when you're supposed to exercise your heart to make it stronger, you're supposed to do something quickly. 
bicycle very quickly or run on the treadmill or whatever. But on the other hand, if you do heavy lifting, carrying stones or weight lifting, you get not that much of a um, lung symptom, but you can get quite a massive pulse. So basically my question is, is it the heart rate, the pulse you can measure by all these new gadgets, that decides whether your heart is getting strong and getting the exercise, or do you need to have this quickness, fastness of activity that gives you also the heavy shortness of breath? The answer is, is yes. <laughs> <laughs> it's really all. It, it's a great question. You know, no, uh, typically people think about uh, aerobic or cardio exercise, as you yeah. described, where you're getting your heart rate up, and that's certainly uh, the best way to uh, increase your stamina from a cardiovascular standpoint. But as you also pointed out, it, it's been increasingly clear in the last few years that other types of exercise, like the isometric, like the resistance that you described with the weights and so forth, that that also has an important input to heart health. And people who add resistance training to the kind of workouts that get their heart rate up improve their heart health further. And so the fascinating question is, well, what's the mechanism? It's not by increasing the heart rate. Uh, it's by it must be by other mechanisms. Now the heart rate can go up when you're doing resistance work, but typically not as much as you're running. So it, it's again it leads to one of the mysteries. We really don't know. Uh, obviously the muscles need more uh, blood when they're when they're working hard. So you do have to get more blood flow. The heart does work a bit harder. But there's something special about resistance that seems to add to heart health beyond that that heart rate. So it's, it's one of the many mysteries and also, you know, it, it again, it's, it's fascinating that when you think about heart health or any aspect of health, you know, it's um, really easy and I think typically it's been compartmentalized where, you know, it's about your cholesterol or it's about what you eat or it's about your sleep or it's about the aerobics or no, it's about the weightlifting. Well, you know, the beautiful thing is the heart has so many inputs, it's about all of them. It's about all of them and I've seen many people who are just stellar in so many of the categories that typically people worry about in terms of risk factors and some other ones like they may have perfect cholesterol, perfect blood pressure and they're under a great deal of stress and, and that I think is the only trigger that seems to be related to sometimes very severe heart problems but in any case getting back to the workouts it's, it's all of the above, it's everything and uh, that's one of the mysteries and also one of the opportunities you know, you, people do as much as they can do. You can't do it all, but there's way, many ways to kind of um, have problems with heart health, and there's also many ways to improve it. And so, you, lots of exercise uh, approaches at your disposal, and the two you mentioned are great ones. See, short uh, follow-up question: If the carrying of rocks or whatever is intense enough and quick enough and without breaks, then you will get quite a bit of heart rate. You will. But, so if, uh, is it the heart rate itself that is the cardiovascular uh, benefit? So, or, or does it matter how you get that increased heartbeat? Yeah. Because like, like many people, they, they might have a disability that prevents them from running, doing things quickly. But then you can add incline instead. You do the heavier things. So you do get the heart uh, beat increase, but you don't get the same uh, panting like you get if you bicycle like a maniac. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's... Uh it's more of the heart rate as a as a um, response to the exercise. I mean, you could get your heart rate up if someone pointed a gun at your head. Yeah. You know, everyone's heart rate would go up. But I I don't think there's any evidence to think that would be good for your heart to do that repeatedly. So, so, it, it's so, not so, just... so all the things about all these watches and bands people do now to check, it's it's not the pulse itself. <laughs> I just like so it. Like, I was going to say I want to ask because <laughs> uh, uh, Trina was asking about um, rate heart rate uh, sort of heart rate versus volume uh, pumping volume. Okay, I want to ask: Wouldn't analogous in physics to that be uh, frequency and amplitude? 
Uh, yes. I think, uh, to some extent, that's exactly correct. The amount of action that you would have if you were, say, doing a uh, oscillatory type of activity would be different if you had uh, a very high frequency and that is very fast and a small amplitude as opposed to very slow and a large amplitude. But let me point out, things like uh, light uh, and the amount of energy that you might get from light is directly correlated with the frequency and not the amplitude. I mean, Einstein got his Nobel Prize based on that. It's called the photoelectric effect. But it had to do directly with the frequency that you actually transferred from one object to the other and not the amplitude that you transferred. Now, that's specific for that type of physics, but not necessarily for riding your bicycle or actually using that, you know, that exercise where you, you move the rope up and down? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Big rope. I've, I've seen those done. It's a very nice, uh, nice exercise. But the speed at which you actually do that really makes a difference. Now, you mentioned, here's something I really am really interested in. You mentioned Einstein. And, of course, we just had the uh, whatever anniversary of the publishing of the theory of relativity. Oh, yes. And one of the really bizarre things uh, that Einstein predicted was that it's not that we are so much, uh, that big masses are attracted to each other, but that big masses change the space time in their local vicinities. Right. And I want to suggest, and so we all know this idea that when you're in love, you want the whole world to know. So when you are in love, we, when we are in love, we perceive things differently. And my guess is that, Andrea, you know a little bit about this because you, there, are, there are techniques that one uses, that you use, to, to uh, graphically portray, that people, artists are taught to graphically portray the joy attendant in every vision of love. Is that true? <laughs> I'm not sure. Now you put me on the spot. I'm not quite sure about that. Um, to me, I mean, my work personally is about really taking a close look at, look at things. So things that are, um, are small, making them huge, and really things that we think we understand, sort of getting deep into them far enough that we no longer understand them. And that's what my, my work is about. So I think that has something to do with what we're talking about. Yeah, yeah. Oh, by the way, we've been joined by our good buddy, Ellen Voss, who is, again, one of the great Coursera neuroscience students, a fellow uh, <coughs> community. I, I remember at the moment, uh, we were, I was with Gordon and Maggie in a parallel hangout with <laughs> Peggy Mason. So if you want Peggy Mason on your hangout, you should send her a new invitation. I'll I, be, well, but the truth is I've sent Peggy lots of them. <laughs> <laughs> this is one of those. This is you know. I I'll send another one out. I I do have been saying. Hey. Well, she came to our hangout and she said, "Well, Ellen, you sent me an invitation. I did nothing of the of the sort because I wouldn't know how to do that." But I don't know. Uh, you know, this this is a it's an experiment. My apologies to everybody because it is a bizarre experiment that we're just. Let me just make a. I want to make a comment about uh, what you just said. Um, I remember a time when we did not have the capability of uh, seeing things um, in, just with our naked eye. So, you know, seeing if a horse uh, galloping, all of their, their legs were off the ground, or doing this really high-speed photography where you can actually see how a drop of, of milk goes into a, a broad-based pan of milk. And I think that that development of technology uh, expanded our capability to to understand some things that we had really no idea how they actually are. We knew the final result, but the action that took place with high-speed photography, I think, changed our entire perception of a number of things that had to do with uh, uh, how actions are at a distance or actions are very close to us. It was very, very uh but you know, it's, of course you're right, Herman, but... I think most of nature is remains opaque to science, doesn't it? Despite the fabulous, and I, I assume that's true in, in, in the cardiology as well. That most of the, or is it not true? That most, the most, of, my impression is that most of nature remains opaque to science. 
<laughs> I guess we don't know what the uh, denominator is, what what the most is, but well, there's I mean, quite like, a bit. There's quite a bit. Well, I mean, did well, you feel like as a and even Aaron, even to say the things that we think we understand, like in the world of cardiology, uh, cholesterol lowering drugs uh, called statins. They're, they're you know, given uh, for people with uh, high risk of heart disease. They lower cholesterol, and they lower the risk of a heart attack. But it, it, was obvi it seemed obvious that the benefit was because we were lowering cholesterol with these drugs. But over recent years, it became very clear that these drugs were very potent anti-inflammatory agents. So it, it seems now very obvious that much of the benefit of these statin medicines is through their ability to lower inflammation independent of lowering cholesterol. Now the fact is it's certainly both uh, that, that are at play, but the whole idea that there was even an action apart from the cholesterol lowering itself was completely foreign. So that's an example of where we were doing something, we knew it was helpful and we knew at least part of the reason why, but as it turns out much of the benefit now we believe to be due to a mechanism that we had no idea about at the start. Well, Herman, you didn't seem you, you seem to disagree when I was saying that it was opaque, that nature was opaque. Is that not true, Herman? I'm sorry, yeah. I I didn't. I, I, I said that to, as far as I understand it, to science, most of nature is opaque, despite the immense tools and toys that we have to observe it. Well, there's the more we learn, the more we realize we don't understand. I mean, I, I think, yes, at some level it is mostly opaque, but when, when I think about uh, scientific research, that is learning things that we didn't know before, and even seeking out answers to questions that we pose now, right? I mean, we may sort of say, let's just go and look and see what we can, see, see what we can find. And that used to be the basis by which a great deal of science was done. Now it actually has to have an operational direction. So if I, you know, go to Congress and say I need, uh, you know, three billion dollars to build a very large atom smasher, I really have to justify that. I have to make sure that I do understand that I'm looking specifically for one particular thing. I'm going to make the measurement. I'm going to tell the world what it is, and I'm going to verify the ideas that I already had or talked about based upon my theoretical and my creativity. So in some sense. We've lost a little bit of that opaqueness to some extent. We've lost a little bit of the capability to say the world and the universe operates this way, and I'm pretty sure it does, uh, and not be able to actually go and investigate it and understand that we need to get the real, the real results of those uh, investigations to be able to say that de definitely. Well, I, I immensely appreciate your time, and I want to apologize again to the, my, my dear friends who we just couldn't get them out of here. But I want to go around here to wrap up, just kind of get a sense from you guys what you, how you think about what your fields and your own passions have to offer to our understandings of the human heart uh, and, and Valentine's Day. And let me just say, let's start my, with myself, because uh, I know I've studied, uh, taken neuroscience classes and studied neuroscience with a lot of you. And for me, the great blessing of science is uh, behavioral biology is that it gives me a bunch of great excuses. Oh wait, before we do, we just, we just got logged in after all this time from, from the UK, Gordon McKay. Gordon McKay, who was a really fascinating, wonderful guy, and I wanted to oh, bear with us for a second. Gordon, welcome. Have you been watching this? Yes, we've been. I've managed to watch quite a bit of it. What happened? What happened? But you couldn't, you didn't get invitations? Uh, yeah, it was a bit mixed up, really. I ended up in a, a separate hangout with Peggy and Ellen and some of the others, but uh, glad to be with you now. I believe Peggy's trying to get in. <laughs> From what you've seen, any questions for our, any of our... Say hello to everybody. <laughs> Hi, guys. Um, I've been, have been hearing some of what you're saying. I must admit, most of my concentration has been on simply trying to join you, but uh, it, it is interesting. Carry on. Well, I'm just curious, like I said, for me, the best thing about behavioral biology is that it gives me a bunch of really great excuses to not be angry with people. <laughs> you, can, you, can always, you can always say, it's uh, too active an amygdala, or it's too much cortisol, or it's, you know, uh, it's uh, a bad sociological environment. 
so that it gives the setting how the, 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 the just nuts and bolts and mechanics of how humans are and how we're all just these biological entities gives me a bunch of excuses to go, oh, well, it's not, it wasn't me personally, it was just that. So I'm curious as to the, how any of you guys find that your work and your passions contribute to your ability to manage the affairs of the human heart. Well, I'll, I'll come in with a, a contribution, if I may. I think one of the great things I've learned from the various MOOCs I've done is actually a social psychology MOOC. Um, and they're talking about something called the fundamental attribution error. I don't know if, how many of you will have come across that, but it was a real eye-opener for me. Um, they talked about a couple of researchers some time ago, decades ago, you can still see the black and white videos on YouTube, uh, Zimbardo and Milgram. Um, Zimbardo put together under Stanford University a fake prison and got volunteers to be um, prisoners and wardens. And after a week, they had to stop it because the wardens were beating up the prisoners. And in the case of Milgram, Thomas Milgram, they had people there who um, were told by a man in a white coat to turn a switch until a fatal electric shock was administered to the guy next door, who was a conspirator, a confederate. Um, they didn't know that, of course. Um, and in most cases, men, women, young, old, professional, non-professional, if the man in the white coat said, please continue, it's part of the experiment, people turned the knob until somebody was electrocuted. And for our purposes, um, affairs of the human heart, as you say there, Aaron, I think it's really fundamentally important because it shows us the fundamental attribution error is about distinguish, distinguishing between the disposition of the individual and the context, and how very often the context significantly informs our attribution and the way we behave, to the point where sometimes we'll look back on the way we behaved with amazement and perhaps a profound disturbance at what we're capable of. You know, uh, you know, speaking about the context, that again really takes us back, gives you an excuse to talk about Einstein and about how the actual physical space changes because in relation to pro relative to proximity. Yeah. The, the, con the context really is everything because the entity itself alters the context. Yeah, our point of view is important too. Say it again. Our point of view is important as well. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Well, you know, that's one of the things we talk about deception, and one of the interesting bits about deception is gravitational lensing. That's right, yes. Yes. But in, in science, you often have a change of paradigm, and then people think about a certain issue in complete. In, things that in ways that haven't been thought of before. So science is not something that's really progressing in one way, but it changes direction sometimes. Well, as does love. Doesn't I mean, you know, you <laughs> love absolutely changes direction. Well, my cousin says that in his 40 years of marriage, he's been married to at least four different women, and his wife has been married to at least six different guys. Uh -huh. well, Andrea, does, does your work all has it altered the way or affect the way you think about your love and your love life as a teacher and a scientist? Yeah, well, I have to say, I, I admitted to say before, but my research is about the psychology of art, so I think a lot about how um, art changes thinking or is a way, is a vehicle for thought. So I should have clarified that earlier. Um, <laughs> what was your question? One thing that I keep thinking about as we're talking is the idea of mystery and and or maybe put a le put more in a different way indeterminacy or ambigu ambiguity and how useful that is the sort of wiggle room in our lives and how important and useful that is in all kinds of different contexts including love like I think that I was talking earlier about the spaces in between and I think for two people in love, that space in between, having that wiggle room, having a kind of tolerance for each other, is so important. Well, you know, that's the thing that Dan destroys. <laughs> that's what it, that is what lawyers, that's why we hate lawyers, right? Because we like that space. We like that wiggle room. And Dan says, <laughs> what account number was that in? And when was that left? Am I wrong, Dan? Right. Well, a lot of a lot of what social scientists try to do and what economists try to do is try to predict human behavior when it comes to money and human relationships. So as much as, you know, man plans and God laughs, same thing. You know, economists can't predict 
how people are going to behave as much as they'd like to try. Your credit card company would like to be able to predict when you're going to spend more money and the stores would want to have you be able to predict when you're going to buy more things on Black Friday and for Christmas and all that. But in reality, people are changeable. People have emotions that go along with their purchases. So it's not just a rational person would, would buy this coat because it's on sale. They might buy it because they like the color or they like the texture. And so what I deal with is I deal with all different kinds of people in all different kinds of decisions that they have to make in affairs of the heart or not, and then they come to me to kind of undo everything and try to figure out what happened. So I'm dealing with a lot of changes in people's lives. So I'm dealing with people at, at very stressful times, but it's always after they've done all sorts of things that yeah, nobody really point, can predict. But my point was that with you, you really do eliminate and fight away the mysteries. Yeah, so so then they're trying to undo what happened and then they and then I have to look look at at their pluses and at their minuses, at their at their balance sheet. Okay, what what happened here? Why you know, why do you have all these charges on your credit cards? And then they didn't realize it, um, and they didn't keep track of it. And so now I have to untangle it all and figure out a good way to solve people's problems. So that that's what drives me to doing what I can do, which is to diagnose their problem figure out what's going on, untangle everything, and help people get, get the ship righted again. You give them a dose of Chapter 11. You're a doctor who uses Chapter 11 to treat Well, it's, it's really only Chapter 7 or Chapter yeah. 13 if you want to get really specific about it. 11's for the Kmarts of the world, but we don't need to go there. But you might save love, you know, the because what? like they say, when uh, the crib is empty, the, dog, the horses start biting, so... Wait, of course, if you help them sort out the financial problems, maybe you save marriages. Wait, yes. What do they say when the crib is empty? It is a saying when people did, um, when you get money problems, you start quarreling and then you ah. get a divorce. Yeah. So he solves the money problem, so maybe he saves the marriages. A lot of times. We are supposed to talk about love today, you know. <laughs> but a lot of times, but a lot of times I can intervene and and save the marriage by by getting everybody back on track and having them have that honest discussion oh, so we can absolutely oh. as training said save people's relationships absolutely so really what you're saying is that sometimes the diminishment of ambiguity right help. well now it also now so, so Herman what what's interesting about what you guys do you physicist types is that you measure or you you, you note your ambiguity in slating your measurements up to the limits of uncertainty, but you but you measure how much you don't know, or you try That's to. That's exactly right. That's exactly. We we always assume that nature is the ultimate arbiter. So we come up and say we're made a measurement, and we find this particular thing to be absolutely exact, uh, except that this is the upper limit of our measurement, and this is the lower limit of our measurement, and it's somewhere in between. And we try to minimize that particular gap as much as we possibly can. And that gives us a great deal more confidence that what we're measuring is absolutely close to what we think should be. But that's but also there's that's always an ambiguity. There's a an error, so to speak. There's a. But that's also the joy of familiarity, right? Because it, it the more familiar you are with an individual, the less ambiguity there is, and the more predictable that behavior becomes, and the less nervous we are, and the more the yeah, the less in uncertainty we have. But we do always have surprises. Oh, yeah. Now, Steve, Steve, in many years as a cardiologist, how often does do hearts surprise you? All the time. All the time. In, in fact, um, over 25 years that I've been in practice, there have been so many reversals and so many surprises. Actually, I wanted to uh, highlight one of them in, in relation to what we were just talking about, the spaces in between, that... Um, uh, another aspect of, of heart failure is that, that typically heart failure has referred to a weakening of the heart when the heart is not pumping strongly and blood builds up and you get swollen ankles and difficulty breathing. But in terms of um, a newer understanding over the last maybe 10-15 years is, is related to the space in between the heartbeats. That even a heart that pumps incredibly strongly can be a heart of severe heart failure. 
And what happens is that although certain hearts can pump strongly, they are not able to fill adequately, which is the space in between the heartbeats. And when they get thickened or stiff for any, there are a number of reasons, the most common of which is high blood pressure, can cause the heart to become stiff. And so even though it's still capable of beating strongly, it like a, a balloon that's difficult to inflate. You've ever tried, you know, some of those balloons, you try and puff and they don't fill up easily it's because they're yeah. stiff. Well, the heart that's stiff can be the same way. So it's become very clear in recent years that a very common cause of heart failure has nothing to do with weakening of the heart, but due to the stiffening of the heart. So if we just measured the old measurements of how much the heart is is uh, contracting, how much it's it's actually beating in, in strength, we could measure a number that's perfectly normal, actually extra normal, extra good, and yet we would be measuring the wrong thing, which we now realize. So getting back to your question of surprises, um, it's really not that the heart the heart isn't changing its its direction or making different moves. It's just that we're understanding them better. We're we're yeah. taking what used to be very narrow goggles and kind of expanding the view, and and seeing them. And, and to me, you know, in terms of what I, I've learned, you know, about the heart, well, cardiology is all about the heart. But what what actually it's more about is is about humanity because people. I think are aware, uh, unlike you know the function of their liver or their kidneys, they're they're aware in many tangible ways. But the heart has a mechanical aspect to it that you can feel. You can feel every second in your chest or in your pulse, and that I think brings people closer to, you know, the idea that 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 really there's an amazing series of things that have to go right to be alive and to be happy and to be functioning in full force. And in the heart, I think the reason why people, I think, feel the emotions are, are kind of in their heart or they feel heartbroken or their chest feels heavy when they're emotional, apart from any physical uh, aspects of, of dysfunction, is that really there's the heart really gives you a window into the wonders of things uh, as they are and as they exist. And I think there's something really beautiful about that. And, and Aaron, in your genius to compile this amazing group of people who look at, at the love and the heart in different ways, we can see there's so many layers to how this operates. And usually people, you know, and myself included, are used to thinking along a certain ways. And how wonderful when you can kind of uh, take all the tangents that really are related but not usually brought together as you have, well, you know, make them all in a package. It's, it's well, fantastic. But, you know, of course, all of our emotional stuff and all of our, in fact, physiology and chemistry do come together in this one beautiful package called the brain. And we have been joined by somebody who knows a whole lot about that beautiful package because she is herself one big, beautiful package of brains. Our <laughs> buddy, Professor Peggy Mason, you made it on. Welcome. Hi. I, yes, well, um, I have to say that my entire uh, neocortex has been very much devoted to trying to figure out Google Hangouts. <laughs> uh, so I'm going to try and reboot uh, and uh, participate in this conversation. I, I have to tell you that uh, in anticipating this conversation, I've been thinking about uh, Alvin, the, the deep ocean submersible, who caught a couple of octopuses having sex about, I don't know, about 10 or 15 years. And, and I remember that it made a big fuss because what we realized was, wow, fun. Sex is fun for the octopus, too. So, and, and, and why is that interesting? Well, because it's fun. <laughs> it because I think it's interesting. It's yeah. fun because it's evolutionarily... You know the way the way we tick along, the way we uh, we make pair bonding something that is uh, rewarding and uh, sex and reproduction, and um, it enables us to evolve from generation to generation. So octopuses are having fun too. <laughs> it was, by the way, two males having uh, some version of sex. Well, but it, so part of, particles join. 
right? When physical particles join together, don't they, Herman? Yes. As a matter of fact, yes. your job, part of what you do, Herman, is I'll break them apart. <laughs> you put together particles that don't even want to be put together. That's You're exactly. a matchmaker for for alienated protons. That's right. And matter and antimatter, for example. Um, really let you know that they don't want to be together because they annihilate each other when they get within you know, a certain uh, sphere of interaction. In fact, when they interact, like what we've done uh, over the years at Fermi Laboratory, and we had particles and antiparticles interacting with one another, that interaction produces pure energy. The particles are completely gone. There's nothing left of them. It's just the energy, and it's an incredible interaction. So when we think about uh, how we actually look at the structure of matter. The quark, which is supposed to be the smallest constituents of matter, if we put three of these quarks together in one of our more complex objects, they don't dissociate. We cannot dissociate them very easily or at all to some extent without creating new particles that glue them back together. And it's an incredible uh, phenomena to try to understand why is nature generated that particular way at its most fundamental level. These are particles that have no subconstituents, so you don't break them up. They have no geometry, basically, but they are connected together. Three quarks for a certain type of particle, and then a quark and an antiquark are uh, for a different type of particle. And these particular systems are designed in such a way, and I should say designed, but they're put together in such a way that they actually are the basis by which we make much more complex systems in our, in our understanding of matter. But if you try to take them apart, you've got to put a lot of energy into it to, to make it happen. But Peggy, you know, speaking of complex systems, our, our little brains, like, for example, when we see someone to whom we are strongly attracted, the brain that you care so much about sends all kinds of instructions to the heart that Stephen uh, uh, studies. How does that, can you explain to us a little bit about that heart-brain connection? I'd love to hear from both of you about it. Well, well, I, ha I have to say, uh, I apologize, Stephen, but um, as, as a neurobiologist, I really resent that uh, the heart has got the uh, the corner on emotion. Uh, so in, <laughs> in popular uh, parlance, somebody has heart. Well, I want to say somebody has brain. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, uh, yeah, so... Um, they are connected. In order in order to do anything, one needs the the mus the motor platform. In other words, and, you know the ability to do it in the physical space. And in order to do that, we need to use our skeletal muscles. And in order to use our skeletal muscles, we immediately have got to get rid of heat, and we've got to get the muscles enough oxygen, enough energy, and all of that um, involves the relatively uh, Unintelligent organ, the heart. <laughs> <laughs> you are heartless with that. <laughs> Sorry, I, 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 I am heartless. <laughs> um, and and in, in contrast to some of the others, uh, you know, I, I am in love with my spouse. I'm also unabashedly very much in love with the nervous system. Um, and and I, yeah, I, I would not, I don't reserve my love for um, humans or even men. Wait, what does it mean? I uh, have great love for the concept and the idea and the knowledge that I have about the nervous system. Uh, wait, 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 you insulted, so anyway, wait, wait, can I just say, you insulted my friend's passion here. Yeah, yeah. Well, let me just give the final word on that. You know, I, I've heard of, uh, uh, you know, there, you can function with a brain that's not not operating uh, very oh. well. But if the heart is gone, I think you're completely gone. So it's it's the last organ standing. <laughs> brain in a vat. Brain in a vat. We come to a we come to a a common. Why don't we we say they're co-conspirators and, yes. and great great ally. Right. And, 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 we don't have to have a winner. But. No, we don't have, a, have to have a winner. Um, Even though if we did, no, no. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Listening no. to Herman talk about the particles being coming together and then working to get them apart, 
um, in the human body, the, the fact of the matter is that we are we are not one organism. We're roughly 500 or more. We have um, a, a a number of various bacteria, virus, fungi, and other living um, organisms that live either in our intestine or in our skin and our mucosa. So we're an amalgamation. Mm -hmm. And um, in, in a similar way as the as the particles will fight you um, to be torn apart, that the same is true. An individual without the biome is not a healthy individual. Uh, so uh, we don't come into this world alone. We're not going to die alone. Um, we might be the only mammal in the the mix, but uh, we are a, an amalgamation already of 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 living organisms. Yeah, good point. A well, thought comes to, me, comes to me here about the um, distinction between the physical, the heart and the brain, that am I not right in thinking that to, to know love, to feel love, there must be a sense of I as separate from the other. To love somebody else, I feel separate and uh, there's somebody else, a sense of somebody else out there. And I wonder if there's a correlation. Um, Peggy talks about the octopus. If we put an octopus in front of a mirror, would it recognize the mirror as another, as itself? This kind of distinction, um, you know, I think the bottom line of what I'm saying is to know what love is, there must be a sense of self and a sense of other. And one of the great things about love, maybe, is that coming together and becoming a greater whole. Or am I getting too romantic? Well, then, you know, actually, your comment just kind of uh, thought of this, uh, this fun kind of interplay between the... Uh, dominance of the heart and brain is, is being, that's actually um, kind of a, maybe a metaphor for love itself, that uh, the brain and heart, although separate, are very closely interconnected. They each contribute something to the whole that the other, you know, isn't capable of doing. And together, I think everyone would agree that when both are functioning optimally, you're kind of a you're you're able to go forth and uh, and 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 do the very best when one when one isn't functioning well it certainly impacts the ability of the other to do its job and for the greater whole to to work so maybe that's maybe that's the lesson of it all you know in terms of the brain heart story it's a love story in and of itself you know i think on that note that's going to be a fine place to end up i want to just immensely thank you so much and thank especially Peggy and Gordon because you guys worked so hard to get on I really appreciate it. So we're going to edit this all in together into a wonderful uh, special that we'll do. But thank you so much. It's been, I think this was probably the first international interdisciplinary <laughs> Valentine's Day science soliloquy ever. <laughs> well, well, I certainly appreciate it. I, yeah, I, it's a great meeting on I'm running, for, I'm running for Congress, and I'm going to take that idea right with me when I go to Congress of trying to get people to cooperate. <laughs> really? Thank you, Aaron. All right. Well, I hope it's the absolute best week of your life. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Peggy, have you said hello to uh, Andrea? <laughs> hey, Andrea. How are you? I'm good. How are you? Where are you? In New York. I live in New York. Okay. Yeah. Wow. Well, we say goodbye to the audience. Bye, audience. We Bye, love you. Bye audience. Bye, audience.